New Zealand is proposing some of the toughest anti-smoking laws in the world. New Zealand is cracking down on smoking in a way we've rarely seen on the planet. New Zealand has come up with a radical plan to phase out smoking. New Zealand has taken a historic step towards a smoke-free future. I think it's a good thing for our babies, eh? You're also good because um, you'll be healthier, more fitter. As you can see, I'm, I'm a bit chubby. <laughs> No one aged older than 14 at the time the planned legislation comes into force will ever be able to legally purchase cigarettes. When New Zealand introduced its world first smoke-free generation legislation under the previous government, the country was celebrated for being a world leader in the battle against the harms of smoking. We know that half of those who take up smoking um, die from its effects. Uh, and I think everyone's in agreement that we need to do more to try and reduce down people taking up smoking in the first place, and if they are smoking, uh, to find safe alternatives and ways for them to quit. Late last year, there was an election in New Zealand, and a new coalition government was formed in December. What you saw in the pre-election fiscal update was the Treasury assessed that the effect of drastically reducing the number of shops that could sell tobacco products, denicotizing those products and introducing a range of restrictions would significantly reduce revenue to the Crown. So smokers will fund the tax cuts because New Zealand First and ACT want the smokers to have access to cigarettes. One of the first policy announcements made by the finance minister was that the last three amendments, very low nicotine cigarettes, the reduction of retailers from 6,000 to only 600 in the country, allowed to sell combustible tobacco, and the ban on anyone born after 2008 from ever purchasing tobacco were going to be reversed. The logic for the smoke-free changes is not about tax revenue. The logic from both ACT and New Zealand First when they came to the negotiating table was their concern that changes planned for the future to those laws would have a couple of uh, nasty side effects. One, they were concerned about the emergence of a big black market for tobacco, unregulated, untaxed. Mm. Second, they were concerned that by vastly reducing the number of retail outlets to around 600, that we could see a huge increase in retail crime, ram raids, people putting, being put in danger. According to Nicola Willis, the new finance minister, we have to remember that the changes to the smoke-free legislation had a significant impact on the government books, with about a billion dollars there. Do you accept that scrapping those changes will mean more people will die? Well, I have not seen advice or analysis of that, so I'm not prepared to give you an answer. More lives will be lost as a result of repealing this legislation. Are you putting profits before people? No, absolutely not. I think it's rather disingenuous to suggest as such. We have a fundamental disagreement that that policy prescription is... We don't believe it's the right prescription. Putting the government's finances before the well-being of our citizenry is, is wrong. Public health modelling conducted in 2022 had shown that the smoke-free policy would have saved New Zealand's health system about US $1.3 billion over the next 20 years. New Zealand still aims to reduce its national smoking rate to 5% by 2025, with the aim of eventually eliminating it altogether. As well, the new government has also promised to look at reversing the ban on oral nicotine pouches and snus, as they are harm-reduced products and have been effective overseas to reduce combustible tobacco smoking. For perspective, more than 80,000 adults have quit in the past year, national data is showing. Currently, about 8% of the adult population smokes in New Zealand. Also, the law reversals still need to be actively repealed through Parliament, and the New Zealand Parliament is not due back until February. Now, for updates from around the Asia-Pacific region. Malaysia had introduced Generation Endgame legislation last year. However, the Generation Endgame part of the legislation was removed as it was stipulated to have contradicted with the provisions under Article 8.1 of the Federal Constitution. This states that every person shall be equal under the law 
and have equal protection of the law. Thailand is still in the process of working towards legalization of vapes. Perhaps we will have something positive to report by the middle of this year. Indonesia has implemented a tax on vapor products. However, consumers and industry are working closely with the government to quash the black market. It is interesting to note that the government of Indonesia is willing to work collaboratively with consumers, unlike the WHO FCTC. Philippines. With the regulations in place, the focus has now shifted to enforcement of the law, ensuring that vendors and distributors are paying their fair share of tax and fulfilling reporting requirements under the new rules. Fourteen years after the first struggle began, Chile vaping regulations have been published in the official gazette. Advocates there are waiting for the publication of the regulations that the Ministry of Health must draft to include warnings, labeling, and advertising rules. As Ignacio Lieva from Chile said, the impossible is possible. This applies to all advocates who are fighting for the right to health, access, and choice. The truth will prevail. It will be based on pragmatism, science, and evidence. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you next month. Until then, stay safe and be well.